He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, nō mai haramai ki te au hurahanga. Hello and welcome to Our Changing World, kō klek and kalan tēnei. Dedicated listeners to the show might remember an episode from earlier this year that RNZ producer William Ray brought us. It was about the giant Tyrannosaurus rex skeletons at Auckland War Memorial Museum. William has long been a bit of a dino nerd. So when we got wind of a dinosaur exhibition coming to Te Papa, he happily reassumed his role as our changing world dinosaur correspondent to bring us this story about some of the world's largest dinosaurs and their surprising link to Aotearoa. It's 101 million years ago. We're near a river in what will one day become Patagonia in Argentina. The ground's wet and muddy thanks to a recent flood, but the surrounding vegetation is thriving. Ferns cover the ground and the occasional conifer tree towers overhead. We hear a noise. It's a rumble which shakes the earth and rattles your teeth. Off in the distance, a group of gigantic creatures are striding towards us. The largest are over 30 metres long, with a long neck and tail stretching out either end of a giant barrel-like body, held up by four legs, each as thick as a large tree trunk. These are Patagotitan, a type of sauropod dinosaur, and they're among the largest animals ever to live on land. There is nothing close to these animals on Earth today. The biggest African elephant would look tiny beside them. Before long, they're all around us. One lowers its massive head and gives us a sniff. Its eyes look towards the river. It strides towards the bank, cranes its neck out, and begins gulping down water. The rest of the herd start wandering away, but our dinosaur isn't phased. Healthy, fully grown Patagotitan are virtually invincible, simply too large for even the biggest predator to tackle. But today, that size is our dinosaur's downfall. It tries to turn and walk away, then stops. While it was drinking, its colossal legs sank deep into the muddy riverbank. As it struggles to lift one leg out, the others only sink deeper. By continuing to struggle, it's only digging its own grave. Eventually, our Patagotitan collapses into the mud for the final time. Over the next few months, its flesh rots away or is eaten by scavengers. But the massive bones remain mostly undisturbed. They're just too big for most other animals to move. Some eventually rot, but others are buried deeply in the mud and sit undisturbed for the next 101 million years. Including a single enormous leg bone. And that bone is currently sitting in front of me at Te Papa Tongarewa, at Te Papa National Museum in Wellington. So, I had no idea that you actually were bringing the fossils out as well. I thought it was just going to be the carcass. Yes. Yeah, it's so exciting. It's the extra special <laughs> <laughs> ingredient in this in recipe. This is Florencia Gehena, spokesperson for MEF Argentina. That's the museum responsible for bringing these fossils all the way from Patagonia to Aotearoa. We're talking at the opening of the exhibition in a large hall on the fourth floor. Kids are racing round and staring up at the giant skeletons surrounding them, or lying down to measure themselves against the giant fossil femur. Can you tell, can you tell the story of how these were found? Yes, it's an amazing story. You know, uh, a farmer in Tubut, near our museum, uh, he was 
on daily tasks and he found a rounded you know rock and he thought that it was those balls you know rock balls that are very common in Patagonia for playing bocce bocce are like an Italian bowling he was like okay I'm gonna be the champion here because I found a very big bocce he started to dig up that rock and suddenly he realized that they keep going yeah <laughs> This Argentinian farm worker, Aurelio Hernandez, alerted the museum to his discovery. But it wasn't until a few years later a couple of paleontologists jumped on a motorbike and headed over to check it out. Came back in the motorcycle, they were like, <laughs> Stop everything! We need to go to that farm! It's amazing! And the rounded shape that, you know, farmer found three years before was the tip of that giant femur and it turns out to be the biggest bone ever found, you know? Really? So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's a 600 kilos femur <laughs> that is 2.4 meters long, and it took six days and a crew of 10 people to dig up that femur. And that's not the only bone that was found at that spot? No. After two years of excavation, uh, they were found 208 bones, yeah, in different layers. And it was a, an incredibly challenging work. Everything is very heavy and very big, as you can see here. Yeah. And, but they weren't, the bones weren't all from the same animal. Exactly. We found there six different animals and all the bones were distributed in layers. So the multiple animals you found probably didn't die at the same time then if they're in different layers? Exactly. Yeah. It's calculated that between layer and layer there are like 10,000 years of separation. So now the mystery is to discover, you know, what is going on in that place. But one of the most, you know, certain theories is that it was a great place for nesting because it was the shore of a river. So they have like a fresh air, fresh water, plants, a lot of plants, they are herbivorous, so it's a great place for nesting. But if the water, you know, grows up and the river grows, it turns out to be very muddy. And if you are a massive dinosaur weighing 60 tons, mud, it's not a great thing. Probably you get stuck and you die. <laughs> but that would, that's crazy though, because that would mean that they were coming back to the same place tens of thousands of years apart into the same place. Yes. That's quite a beautiful story in a yes, way, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And uh, that they have a, you know, similar, you know, social behaviour like today's reptiles or today's mammals even. But this exhibition at Te Papa isn't just meant to show off Patagotitan. It's here to show off a whole bunch of dinosaurs from the same region of Argentina. And Patagotitan, as it turns out, is a great place to track the wider story of sauropod dinosaurs. And sauropods, by the way, are just a big group of dinosaurs with the same basic body plan. Large, four-legged plant eaters with long necks and tails. Te Papa curator Dr Felix Marx agrees to take me back to the start of that story. We wind back 125 million years before Patagotitan. And yeah, if the numbers sound kind of crazy, just remember dinosaurs were around for a really long time, 165 million years. We have to go nearly as far back from Patagotitan to its earliest relatives as we would have to go forward from Patagotitan to reach the modern day. In any case, we're now back in the Triassic period, roughly 235 million years ago, with a tiny dinosaur called Aoraptor. Aoraptor is one of the very first dinosaurs to evolve, and a very distant ancestor of Patagotitan. Aoraptor, you can see, is pretty small, um, and it was probably a meat eater, and that's true of all of these very, very early dinosaurs. That's just where they were coming from in terms of their early morphology. Morphology just means the size and shape of an animal. Is its neck long or short? Are its teeth sharp or blunt? Did it walk on two legs or four? As Felix said, Aoraptor was small, roughly the size of a small dog. 
It had sharp teeth, grasping hands and ran around on two legs. And that was a typical morphology for many early dinosaurs. But Aoraptor was a step towards something very, very different. This one is already related to this lineage of like really gigantic plant eaters, the sauropods with the long necks and the long tails, but you don't really see that very much in this guy yet. We take a few more steps into the exhibition, marking a transition from the Triassic to the early Jurassic. So fast forwarding about 40 million years. This period included one of the largest extinction events in the Earth's history. Virtually all large animals on land were wiped out, and funnily enough, we still don't know exactly how. Maybe it was climate change, or a series of huge volcanic eruptions, or even an asteroid like the one which eventually drove the dinosaurs extinct. Whatever happened, it cleared the way for two-legged little meat-eating dinosaurs like Aoraptor to evolve into new ecological niches. Felix takes me to the next dinosaur in the exhibition, Massospondylus. So we're, we're now in the Jurassic, so that second extinction has happened and now dinosaurs have really taken off and these um, sauropods, which started with something like Eoraptor, are starting to become definitely plant eaters. They're starting to walk on all four, so we're not 100% sure whether this form was walking on two legs or four, but probably at least doing both part of the time. Um, and you can start to see a, a head with much blunter teeth, for example, um, and you start to see a bit of a longer neck. And this is what we would call a pro-sauropod, so uh, something that came before the true sauropods, but definitely on the way there. Massospondylus definitely looks a bit more like Patagotitan in terms of basic body shape, but it's still pretty small. Maybe the body mass of a large dog, but much longer. But as we get further into the Jurassic, things get a lot bigger. And we run into Felix's personal favourite dinosaur from the new exhibition. Brachytrachylopan. <laughs> Brachytrachylopan. 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 Brachytrachylopan is a bit of a mouthful, but it's a really funky dinosaur. It's like one of the most unusual ones I've seen. So it's a sauropod, it's a long-necked dinosaur, but it's one that started off long-necked and then decided, I want to become short-necked again, which gives it a really weird body proportion. It's very unique, actually. I've never quite seen anything like it. I've got to agree with Felix here. Brachytrachylopan is super weird to look at. It has the long tail and barrel-shaped body of your classic sauropod, but its neck is really short, only just long enough to reach the ground without bending its legs. It looks kind of stocky, like a sumo wrestler. And Felix says they think the reason it evolved this way is linked to the breakup of the supercontinent of Pangaea into two smaller supercontinents. There was Laurasia in the north, which is made up of what's now North America, Europe and Asia, and Gondwana in the south, made up of the land that's now South America, Australia, New Zealand, India, Africa and Antarctica. Both of these supercontinents had dinosaurs on them, but in Gondwana, there was a big group of dinosaurs missing. The Ornithischians. Ornithischians were extremely successful in the Northern Hemisphere in the role of mid-sized herbivores, browsing plants low to the ground, kind of like a modern-day buffalo or rhinoceros. And these included a lot of very famous dinosaurs like Triceratops, Iguanodon, Stegosaurus, Parasaurolophus, Ankylosaurus. Those are all types of Ornithischian. But for whatever reason, the Ornithischians didn't really take off in Gondwana which left an opening for sauropods like Brachytrachylopan. In the environment where it lived, there weren't things like Triceratops or Iguanodon around, nothing of that size that would otherwise have eaten plants at that level. And so sauropods started to evolve these shorter necks and smaller sizes in the area to actually make use of that ecological niche. So it, they kind of went back, backtracked a bit on their, their own sort of evolutionary pathway to become smaller and sort of shorter necked again. But long necks aren't the only things which set sauropods apart. If you look at modern plant-eating mammals, you'll notice most have wide, flat teeth for chewing up leaves and twigs. Ornithischian dinosaurs were also big chewers. It's partly why they became so successful, because chewing your food makes it easier to digest. 
But sauropods had a very different eating strategy. Sauropod teeth are long and relatively thin, not sharp like a meat-eating dinosaur, but more like the teeth of a garden rake. And that's basically what they were for, raking leaves off a branch so the sauropod could swallow them whole. And Felix says this no-chew eating strategy helps answer one of the most common questions people have about sauropods. The main question is, why could sauropods grow so large? And one, one of the proposed reasons is that basically they didn't waste any time chewing. They just kept gathering food and gathering food and gathering food. They could do that very quickly because they just literally ripped it off. But then they needed a large gut to actually digest all of this. So you can think of your average sauropod as a vacuum cleaner crossed with a compost bin. Their long necks and peg-like teeth let them hoover up the leaves all around them without going through the trouble of moving their big, heavy bodies. And all those unchewed leaves were swallowed down into their guts, which are effectively giant compost bins or fermentation tanks, where microbes could slowly break them down into something more digestible. I imagine sauropods as a kind of feeding platform, if you like. So you stand there, you've got this long neck, you sort of graze everything in the area, then you move on and you do a bit more of that. And then at the same time having a very large gut where you can process all of this food. And then one other adaptation really, not necessarily for big size, but which helped was that they had this series of air sacs, just like a modern bird has. These air sacs are really there to improve breathing efficiency. So they allow a unidirectional flow of air through the lung, as opposed to sort of a tidal in and out like what we have. Um, but it also means that not only do you have more oxygen coming through, which helps with big size, but it also means that you have some air pockets even in your bones, and that makes your bones light. And of course, if you want to grow large, lighter bones always help. So it's a feedback loop. For a sauropod, a bigger gut meant more efficient digestion, but being bigger meant they had to process more food, which then meant they needed a bigger gut, and so on and so on. And at the very end of this feedback loop, we find the star of our show. The biggest animal ever to walk the earth. Patagotitan maiorum. Well, actually, we can't really say it was the biggest. As Felix explains, there's a lot of different types of large sauropod, and it's kind of hard to tell for sure which was the longest or heaviest. You have to remember that we very rarely find a complete dinosaur. Usually you find bits, and then we have to sort of try and estimate the rest based on sort of equations we come up with by comparing different bones and comparing them to living animals. And these equations change, and the amount of measurements we can put into those equations change, and every time we add something, the estimates change. And so this just fluctuates back and forth and back and forth. And of course, the other thing you have to remember, dinosaurs were around for hundreds of millions of years in the end, and you know, it only takes one more discovery to change everything again. So Patagotitan may not have been the very biggest, but it's certainly one of the top contenders. It's currently estimated a fully grown animal could be over 30 metres long and weigh up to 57 tonnes. That's heavier than 14 African elephants. Standing beneath its replica skeleton at Te Papa, is kind of an awe-inspiring experience. It's so tall, its back brushes the ceiling above me. Its rib cage is so broad, you could fit a small car inside it. Its neck and tail are so long that Samuel, the videographer who's come along with me to the museum, he can't find a spot to stand which will fit the whole animal in frame. In fact, Florencia Gehena tells me that when they put the skeleton on display at the New York Natural History Museum, it literally didn't fit in their main hall. They had to have its head poking out the front door. It creates this sort of feeling in your gut, isn't it? Just seeing something so huge and imagining how it must have moved and yeah. Yes, and the challenge that is to be a giant, you mm. know? Imagine the blood pressure, the handling of air, the lungs, you know, the legs of the, that, this dinosaur, they have strong muscle attachments mm. because they must have muscles like compression socks, you know, to regulate the blood pressure. Right, of course. Yeah. Because <laughs> if it raises up its head, that's like, what, a 30 metre pressure differential between the exactly. head and the toes? Exactly. Yeah. You need a powerful, you know, 
pumping, you know, heart there. So uh, the heart is, you know, thought to be 1.5 meters, you know, in diameter. Uh, so, and everything is a challenge and you need to eat a lot. Yeah. You need to eat all the time, actually. It's very stressful. So, uh, it's quite a challenge to be a giant in the Cretaceous. <laughs> And here's the next crazy thing. Patagotitan wasn't the only giant dinosaur whose fossils were found at that farm in Patagonia. And I was hearing the other thing that you found at the same site was a whole bunch of teeth from yes. this other huge dinosaur yes. which we're standing next yes. to. Yes, this is uh, Tyrannotitan. Tyrannotitan is from a very, very well-known family of dinosaurs, of carnivorous dinosaurs, that it's called Carcarodontosaurus, and that means dinosaur with uh, teeth of a shark. The teeth are like a shark in that they're serrated along both edges, but also seem to have fallen out of the animal's mouths fairly regularly. But they grow again, like sharks, you know? So we found it's very common to find a lot of different kind of teeth from Carcarodontosaurus there because they are like <laughs> spending their teeth everywhere. <laughs> the replica skeleton of the animal which shed these teeth is standing by the opposite wall. And while it's not nearly as large as Patagotitan, it's still a monster. Tyrannotitan was among the largest predatory dinosaurs to ever exist, possibly as big or even bigger than its North American equivalent, Tyrannosaurus rex. And Felix Marx says the fact Tyrannotitan teeth were found alongside Patagotitan bones is pretty good evidence Tyrannotitan fed on this giant sauropod. Although that doesn't necessarily mean hunting, it meant probably scavenging, maybe hunting. You probably wouldn't have one of them take down an adult Patagotite, and a young one, a sick one potentially, and of course there's always the chance that they might have hunted in groups, you never quite know. But scavenging, to be honest, is just easier. I mean, if you have a, a big carcass lying around and you're a Tyrannotite, no one's really going to argue with you. <laughs> so in that case, why not? Why not just make use of what's already there? It's amazing to look at all these fossils and casts, and while the dinosaurs look so strange and foreign, actually, it's kind of a homecoming for them. I'll let Florencia explain. Actually, one of the scientists at our museum, mm. when uh, we started to pack everything, you know, for shipping last year, no, two years ago, and one of the scientists was there and was looking the shipping list and, you know, the packing and everything like that. And he was like, so these dinosaurs will come back to Australia and New Zealand. And we were like, what? Remember, we mentioned South America and Aotearoa were once part of the same southern supercontinent, Gondwana. We've been, you know, sharing fauna and flora with Australia and New Zealand and India and South Africa during... 100 million years because we share the Gondwana continent and these dinosaurs are just coming back to their home mm. you know because yeah we were all together united by the Antarctica bridge so that's it's like it was mind-blowing for me you know and for some more evidence of this link Felix Marx took me down to the basement at Te Papa to show me well, at first glance, it looked just like a lumpy rock. No, it doesn't look like much, but you can sort of see like the, the front and the back here, and that shape gives it away as a titanosaur. This lumpy rock was pulled out of a tributary of Te Hoe River, just south of Te Uruwera in 1999, by the famous fossil hunter, Joan Whiffen. She found it while hunting for fossils of large marine reptiles. I'm not 100% sure. I think this was one of the last ones, maybe the last ones she found. Um, of dinosaurs at least, and from what I recall she said she was actually in the field and saw a bone structure that looked a little bit unfamiliar, that didn't look like sort of the typical marine reptile, but she didn't quite know what to make of it, and so the specimen was then taken out of the field and was starting to be prepared, and in the end it turned out to be the titanosaur. Titanosauria is sort of a subgroup of sauropods, and it's a group which includes Patagotitan. So maybe New Zealand was also once home to giant long-necked dinosaurs. 
What's more, Joan Whiffin also found several other dinosaur fossils in her life, including one from a large meat-eating dinosaur, maybe even a relative of Tyrannotitan, although this one would have been much smaller. These single bones can't be used to reconstruct full animals. But if we look at fossils from all over the lost supercontinent of Gondwana, places like Australia, Africa, South America, India, we can at least start to build a picture of Aotearoa in the age of the dinosaurs. Ngā Tanifa o Rūpapa, the dinosaurs of Patagonia, will be on display at Te Papa until April 2024. After that, Florencia says they'll eventually be heading back home, where the Argentinian public will get to see them for the very first time. I was, I was talking to one of your colleagues on Skype a few weeks ago. One thing you mentioned, which made me feel really sad, is that, that this has never been, been able to go on exhibition in actually Argentina. Exactly! Yeah, it's yeah. terrible! Yeah, because it doesn't fit in our current facilities in the museum. So we are now, you know, working night, day and night to build the new museum, uh, the new building in yeah. our museum to host this dinosaur in our museum. Special thanks to my guests, Felix Marx and Florencia Gehena, and to Te Papa Museum and the Department of Conservation for allowing us to use the soundscape in this podcast. Thanks, William. This episode was produced by William Ray, who spoke to Dr. Felix Marx from Te Papa and Florencia Gehena from MEF in Argentina. Production help was by Ellen Rikers. Sound engineering was by William Saunders and Tim Walken is executive producer of podcast and series at RNZ. Our show webpage is at rnz.co.nz slash ourchangingworld and we'll include a link to a video from the dinosaur exhibition. If you've got feedback for us, you can email ourchangingworld at rnz.co.nz or you can find us on Facebook or X where we are at RNZ Science. Now, when he's not making Our Changing World Dinosaur specials, William Ray produces the multi-award winning podcast Black Sheep. Its sixth season just bagged the award for Best Overall Podcast for the 2023 New Zealand Podcast Awards. Black Sheep tells the stories of the shady, controversial and sometimes downright villainous characters of New Zealand history. The episodes are beautifully produced, creating scenes that take you back in time. I highly recommend it. Find it wherever you get your podcasts or on the RNZ webpage. This is our last new episode for the year, but never fear, from next week we'll have some replays and some podcasts made by science communication students to keep you entertained across the summer break. But from all of us at Our Changing World HQ, as we wrap things up for 2023, te nā koe i mai i Thanks so much for listening this year. Ko klerk in Have a great week. Kia pai, the wiki.